Um, okay, so I'm just going to continue on. Um, maybe I should assume, well, maybe in any case, it's good that I do a little resume of yesterday. Uh, so my plan, my overall plan was this to give, can you hear me all right? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, a brief introduction, so to give a little overview of the problem of structure formation and cosmology. So the, here I, I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, I'm not talking about my own work, I'm just trying to give a, it is some, in many points obviously my own perspective, but really I'm just reviewing very standard material. I didn't put many references uh, in my slides. I'll try and complete with some, uh, some references for people who, who if, if, if you're interested. Um, that was my original plan. I'll just change probably more like that. I'll, the last part is something closer to uh, just a specific uh, model I've worked on, which I think is interesting, but we'll see how much I have time left for that it's, if I do. Um, so the main points yesterday, so just to remind you, uh, I just told you about what this problem of, what the problem of large-scale structure formation is. It can be kind of uh, summarized in this picture. Basically, you know, this is the universe, the prime early universe, uh, the young universe with small fluctuations. These correspond to small density fluctuations. And this is a picture uh, of the universe today, very large fluctuations, these large structures. This is the problem of large-scale structure formation. And uh, what I tried to explain was that um, the, essentially most of the non-trivial part of this problem can be really treated in the Newtonian limit. And really, it's just then just a purely self-gravitating system and uh, treated in the, Newtonian, in, in the Newtonian limit. And that really is a very good approximation for basically because the universe is dominated by matter that's non-relativistic. And, uh, and because the gravitational potentials remain weak, um, you're in the Newtonian limit. Uh, I spent some time explaining then what this Newtonian limit is. This is a little bit subtle what it is because we're talking about a very specific system, which is an infinite system. You know, the universe is, the, the universe we're, we're is, is uh, modeled as, a, as an infinite system in, the, in, the, in, the, in this context. And uh, so um, I explained that this meant to obtain the equations. So I really, all this was aimed at just explaining what the actual equations of motion are for this self-gravitating system. And so I explained that you have, you know, so-called physical coordinates, which is, you know, the position of a particle. And, you know, if you have two, two galaxies, you know, this is the distance, the physical distance between particles. And then you derive, we, we define a co-moving uh, co variable. The co-moving variable just takes out the expansion of the universe. And the expansion of the universe, I wrote down the equations, it can be written for a matter-dominated universe, it's just this. I didn't, so this is the mean density of the universe, which is a function of time. As the universe scales, it, it, length scales go as one over A. Uh, this goes as one over A cubed. The mass density goes as one over A cubed. And you can show that in the matter-dominated universe, this gives you A going as T to the two-thirds. It's not actually gonna be important for anything uh, I do, but it's just, uh, I didn't say it maybe clear enough yesterday, this function A of T is just the uh, expansion of the universe given by a simple function of time. We can use A or T as the, as the time variable, and I usually, you know, we, in practice we'll usually use A as the time variable instead of the time variable. So uh, to the equations that are written down are equations in co-moving coordinates. So um, you have here... Uh, just a, uh, an inertial term, a kind of damping term that comes from the expansion of the universe. And then on the right-hand side, you have what I've written as the regularized force. The regularized new Newtonian force is really just the Newtonian force uh, with the contribution of the mean density subtracted off. So I said, in terms of maybe what gelium or one component, uh, one, the one component plasma, you would get the same equations you, what you're doing is solving basically the same equations just with this extra damping term and with a change of sign. So it's just exactly the same kind of regularization as induced in a one component plasma by the background. So um, in cosmology, we're interested in principle in the Vlasov-Newton or Vlasov-Newton limit, a continuum limit. And uh, so the equations that we're, we would really like to solve are for the phase space density like this. 
and uh, they correspond just uh, you can, in an obvious way. You see the damping force and the, the gravitational force, the gravitational force, the regularized gravitational force being uh, coming from the mean density. Okay, uh, so yeah, I, I do just can't emphasize enough that the, the uh, so the, the, what are the initial conditions? That's the next uh, thing that I talk, to, talk about. Uh, so I said the initial, the initial conditions for the phase space are for this typical cold dark matter scenario, which is the kind of standard scenario in cosmology, is that you have a phase space, so you have a row X of T at the beginning as our initial condition, Right, so our rho x of t, i, is rho zero times one plus delta x t i. Okay, the density fluctuation at the beginning of t at the beginning of the simulation, and this is specified as a realization of a Gaussian uh, stochastic process. So it's spe it's it's uh, it's uh, specified by the variance of the modes in Fourier space, which is basically just the power spectrum or the, the structure factor, okay? So that completely uh, specifies your initial, your initial condition. And a cosmologist, you need to do some relativistic cosmology to calculate, where did I lose my, yeah. You need to do some relativistic cosmology to know something about, uh, you know, to go beyond Newton in order to calculate this spectrum, but at the time the problem becomes Newtonian, you just have some input spectrum, okay? So those are your initial conditions. So the thing I, yeah, one of the other things I said that's important about these initial conditions is that if you define, uh, like if you define a coarse-grained, uh, you, you coarse-grained the density field on some scale R, so suppose we take a sphere, right? So we take the volume of the sphere and we integrate over the sphere delta r d3r, okay? And we calculate the variance of this. So the variance of density fluctuations in a sphere, this is a monotonically decreasing function of scale, okay? At the, in these initial conditions. And in any cosmological initial condition, that will be true, okay? Monotonically decreasing with that. Okay, so those are our initial conditions. We have our equations, and I said a little bit about uh, dynamics. So I start the most simple, the essential thing is the, 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 the essential starting point is so-called linear theory. When the density fluctuations are small, they are just amplified. So this delta k, you know, delta k of t is just a of t, delta k of t i or let's say AT over ATI, okay? So the density fluctuation just gets amplified and, um, sorry, maybe not. Density fluctuations just get amplified. The amplification of the density fluctuation, you know, obviously amplifies this as well. So what happens is that the linear, this linear amplification drives nonlinear, dri drives you into a regime where it's no longer um, where it's no longer valid, and you get a time of, the time of nonlinearity is, 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 is going to depend on the scale, at any given time, you have a scale at which the system is going to go nonlinear, and that increases in time. And that's what's called hierarchical structure formation. Uh, what's non-trivial about it, as I repeat it again, what's really non-trivial is that it says that when a certain scale is going to go nonlinear, really just depends on the initial density fluctuation at that scale. It doesn't depend on smaller scales. So structures are going to evolve, basically, and go nonlinear uh, in a way that's completely determined already by this linear theory. Um, I mean, I didn't demonstrate that, but uh, nobody, I don't think anybody has really demonstrated it rigorously, but... Uh, we see it's definitely true, seen in numerical simulation and so on. Okay, for today, so I'm going to go on uh, and just say, so we're going to say, what happens in this strongly nonlinear regime? What happens when you start forming highly, where you go into a regime where you cannot uh, treat the problem 
in a linear manner, or even where you can't really treat it perturbatively at all. There is quite a lot of work analytically in the literature on uh, pertur perturbation theory, improving perturbation theory, but you always go into a regime where all that breaks down, and what I'm interested in talking about is the really completely nonlinear regime. So uh, there are, in fact, very few analytical results. We have very few analytical guidelines, even for simple cases, and that's one of the limitations and one of the problems in the field is that you could do a numerical simulation, a very big numerical simulation, but you really don't have very much control on it, and you have to, therefore, obviously be very careful about uh, trying to understand uh, the numerical, uh, eventual numerical problems or problems related to the discretiza discretization. But uh, there are a few simple... Uh, uh, guideline ideas about the nonlinear regime, and I'm, that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. Um, then I'm going to talk about numerical simulations, not in any great deal, uh, uh, detail. I can, if, if, if people want, I can, I can also give them more references on that. Um, there's a huge field of numerical simulation, and I'm just going to try and outline what are the kind of qualitative results. And basically what I'm going to try and explain is how people, or cosmologists, describe the nonlinear regime, how they actually characterize it, and uh, the kind of results that they get and the way they understand that. And then I'm going to talk about some, some open issues and which maybe, you know, have, uh, try and make some connections to some things that were that problems that are more general in long-range interactions. Okay, so before I go on, does anybody have any burning questions? It doesn't. Okay, so uh, the simplest um, model you can think of for trying to understand nonlinear structure formation going beyond the linear regime is an incredibly obvious and simple model, and you would think maybe it's so obvious and simple that it can't have anything to do with reality. In fact, it turns out to be a model that seems to have tremendous relevance and is almost the one of the, it's one of the main guidelines that people really have in their understanding the nonlinear regime. So let me explain this model. It's the non-so-called spherical collapse model. So the spherical collapse model, I don't know who first wrote this down. I mean, this is very old. It must go back to... It's, uh, I don't know who the, the original reference, who originally wrote this down, but uh, in the spherical collapse model, what you do is you just consider a single overdensity sitting in the middle of an otherwise homogeneous universe. So the background density is rho equal to rho zero, and in the middle you put, or not in the middle, somewhere you have a single overdensity, okay? You start it at some time. And that density, that, that, so it's just a top hat over density, a uniform over density. You have, it has a certain radius, okay? So we can write the co-moving, this, oh, this is all in co-moving coordinates. It has a certain co-moving radius. And basically, one can write down, it's quite trivial, the equations of motion using Gauss's theorem for this. And uh, you get uh, the evolution. It's really like a slightly overdense universe inside, uh, inside uh, the, over, the, the average universe, the density is just a little bit higher, and it collapse, turns around. So what happens? Initially, the sphere follows the expansion, right? Well, I've, if, if I consider the physical size of the sphere, it originally follows the, initially follows the expansion, with the, and then at some point, it uh, so-called turns around, it stops moving in physical coordinates, and it collapses down. And what happens, you could write the solution in an exact the solution, uh, exact solution in a parametric form, which I've written here. Now, the very nice thing about the solution, or the way you can consider the solution, is that you can write the radius of the ball uh, with respect to its asymptotic radius. So the R0 would be the radius that you would get in the asymptotic past as it goes back to the mean density, okay? So R, R0 would be R equal to R0, as A goes to zero, as you go backward in time, okay? So uh, what you see is that you can write, actually, the actual density. So you can use mass conservation, or R0 cubed is equal to rho uh, R cubed, okay? And then so you can write delta, the density, the full density at any time, is just rho over rho zero minus one, and that's equal to what R zero over r cubed minus one. So you can write the full 
density as a function of t not just uh, you could you could write it as a function of, you could write it as a function of theta, but more usefully you can write it as a function of the linear amplitude. What's the linear amplitude? The linear amplitude is just the initial amplitude multiplied by delta zero. Okay, so you can write it the nonlinear amplitude as a function of the linear amplitude. So remember, the linear amplitude is just a monotonically growing function, so you can use the linear amplitude as your time variable, if you like, and you can write the nonlinear amplitude as a function of the linear amplitude. You can write the real density of the system as it collapses as a function of the linear density. Okay? And what you find is that when the density is low, you get linear So, okay, I'll just show, I mean, maybe it's not very easy to see. So the red line is, so this is the nonlinear versus the linear. You've got the red line corresponds to linear theory, it just it's, a, it's linear. And the green line is the increase in density of the system. It's going faster than linear, okay? Nonlinear evolution is more efficient. It leads to a much a more efficient collapse of the system than, uh, and what happens in a finite time is that you have a singularity at a finite time, so the system is just going to collapse down to an infinite des density in the solution, and you can say that that singularity will happen at a time when the linear density has a certain amplitude. You can calculate, you know, if it just went on evolving linearly, at the same time, it would actually have an amplitude one could write down is 1.68. When the density has got to 1.68, the actual sphere will have collapsed rather than just been amplified to 1.68, okay? So uh, this model, as I say, very simple, can actually be uh, used as a, as, a, as a model to try and say, once we're inside this universe and a region collapses, what does it do? This is the guideline for what it does. It just, in a time which you can estimate from the model, it actually collapses and, well, so in the model it collapses. In reality, of course, we're treating here, why does it collapse to a singularity? Because you've taken a perfectly uniform density. In reality, your system is going to have some density fluctuations in it, and that's going to lead to this, the singularity being regularized. It's not actually going to collapse to be singular. So the system actually, I mean, just to illustrate, sorry, I'll just go back a second. So if we consider just an isolated cloud, basically from the time the solution turns around, okay, from the time it, when it turns around, what we call turns around, it's, it's exactly at rest in physical coordinates. And it's already quite dense compared to the background. So we can just treat it as a system that's like this, isolated in space. It's just, so here we've got some fluctuations. This is just Poissonian fluctuations. You follow, you know, what happens, in fact, is that, okay, this is just a numerical solution of a collapsing cloud. What happens is that instead of collapsing to a singularity, it stops at a finite radius and it reaches a quasi-stationary state. So this is all, you know, this is the physics of an isolated system in the Vlasov limit in principle, at least in, in, in whether there are non-Vlasov effects in the numerical simulations, another question. But basically, you know, you have the collapse and virialization of the system and it virializes very, very efficiently. This is the, very, very efficiently, this is the virial ratio of the system and what you see is that with incre incredible efficiency, it actually, uh, you know, virializes and becomes a quasi-stationary state for coal, yeah. Uh, well, the point, what I actually showed is without the damping term, but to an excellent approximation in physical coordinates, it's without a damping term. You see, that's what's a, in the physical coordinates, it really becomes like an isolated system and there's no damping term. See, the damping term is in, is in the co-moving coordinates, but I can change back to the physical coordinates. And when I've got an overdense system like that, it's just behaving like an isolated system in those coordinates without damping. It's a pure isolated self-gravitating system to a very good approximation. Right? And that, so that, that's where there really is, this is the connection between the cosmological simulation and isolated simulations. It really is behaving more or less like an isolated object. Okay? Yep. Oh, yeah, okay, I don't want to get too fixed on the, it's just really, it was just really to show an example of a, 
it's not that it's going to look exactly like that. Yeah. I, th this, is the, this is actually very going to be very dependent on the initial conditions, what exactly happens. You know, I'm just, to a first approximation, you see, if it was completely uniform, it would be singular. The singularity is regularized by the fluctuations I've put in. Now, that's, it's another discussion about what, what are the right fluctuations to put in and how that's going to affect the final state and what happens. But I, for the moment, I don't want to get into that discussion, okay? It's an it's interesting and relevant discussion, but it's not what I want to put now. Okay, so, okay, this spherical collapse model, so again, this really naive model gives you, you can assume, you can extend it, so it becomes, the, the matter density actually becomes singular. What you can assume is that if you just assume that instead of going singular, you get a virialized structure, which seems to be indeed what happens if you put in some fluctuations. If you assume you've got energy conservation, that may or may not be a good assumption of the, of the, of the isolated system, you can actually do a simple calculation in three lines in which you can calculate the density of, that, of the collapsing system when it has virialized. So you can say it starts from some size, it collapses, and it would virialize. And when it virializes, it will be about a sixth of its initial size. It will bounce back and give you a structure that's about a sixth of its initial size with an overdensity which corresponds to being overdense about 200. That number 200 appears a lot in cosmology. If you go and look at the cosmological literature, there's a, it's a figure that appears a lot because of this model and because it seems to be really pertinent. It really is, it's supposed to represent the density compared to the mean density of the universe of an object that's, very, that's just virialized, okay? So this all comes from this very, very simple model, okay? So, uh, you can also do, let me just keep an eye on the time. Um, I just want to mention some other things you can do analytically. This, there's a so-called Press-Schechter formalism, uh, introduced by Press and Schechter, in which they now exploit the spherical collapse model in the following way. The spherical collapse model tells you that a, 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 cyst, a, a region, a spherical region, will virilize when its linear density extrapolated linear density contrast reaches some value, 1.68. So if I take my initial field and I just take a spherical region, I can say that spherical region, I expect it to have collapsed and virialized when the density contrast has reached that value. So what President Schechter did was they said, well, the initial conditions on the power spectrum allow us to calculate the statistics of the initial density field. If I throw down a sphere in the initial density field, I have the statistics of the fluctuations. Or I can, at any given time, I can calculate the probability that the density fluctuation in a certain region has reached this value. And I can just use the initial density field, the initial statistics of the density field, to predict how many collapsed structures I will have of any given mass. Okay? There's an, it's not a very long calculation. It's, uh, uh, and one can so use this simple reasoning to construct what we, what's called the halo mass, or the the mass function of virialized objects, which is often written like M, you know, cosmologists will write M -Z, M Z would be the number density of virialized objects of mass M at the redshift Z, which is related to the scale factor, okay, as a function of time. And this is a simple, so this is an analytical calculation that one can do. And so these all inform the nonlinear regime. Okay. I think I'll jump, yeah, I'll just say one or two words about that. One of the other, uh, there are a few other kind of analytical thing, uh, uh, regimes in which you can get some analytical prediction for the nonlinear regime. One of them is in the case where you put in a power law initial condition. So instead of putting in a cosmological initial condition, which I said has something like that, you just put in a simple power spectrum, P of K proportional to K to the power of N, okay? The fact that there's no characteristic scale in the power spectrum you can, allows you through a simple dimensional analysis argument to say that you have to have a property called self, which is self-similarity, which says that the, cor the, the temporal ev evolution of the correlations in the system or of the density fluctuations in the system have to be equivalent to a, just a rescaling of the, the, of the lens scales. And that's called self-similarity. And that's true when you take a simple, should be true, when you take a simple power. So that's one analytical prediction you have for a certain case 
for the non-linear regime. One other uh, 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 approach you can take is you can say, what happens, okay, these clumps, they collapse, okay? Small clumps first, big clumps next. After a clump collapses, after a clump virilizes, what does it do? One th the simplest thing you can say is, well, maybe it behaves as, it's, as if it sees nothing else, nobody else. It doesn't see the rest of the mass distribution. And in that case, it's just going to remain virilized. And it's virilized in physical coordinates. Okay? It remains virilized in the physical coordinates, which means that in the co-moving coordinates, it will reduce in size because they're rescaled. Okay? So that's what you call stability. That's called the stable clustering hypothesis. And that can give you predictions. Okay? But those are very limiting cases. It's clearly not an approximation you expect to be uh, valid for too long. Or clearly, these clumps, they're not going to behave as if they're completely independent. You have clumps inside clumps. They're going to interact with one another. You know, you're not, they're not going to be independent. But those are the analytical, uh, some of the analytic approaches that can be used. I have a couple of slides on them if you want to look at them. OK, so numerical simulations of cosmological structure formation. So what one does in practice is what people do and have been doing for the last uh, 40 years at least is putting this on a computer. Uh, you'd like to solve, a cosmologist ideally would like to solve the vlasov poisson equations. But that's a six-dimensional system in three, in, 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 uh, in three dimensions that corresponds to solving a, 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 you have a dependence on six variables. And numerically, if you want any sort of decent, uh, you want to get anything useful for cosmology, it requires, it implies huge numerical cost, which is really just not. Why do you need resolution? Well, because we've seen structures collapse. That means you have a coupling of scales. You know? We have a coupling of the fluctuations over a range of scales that's, that grows in time. And uh, if you're going to really follow and resolve those scales, you need incredible resolution in six dimensions. It's not very difficult to convince yourself that to do a Poisson, a Vass of Poisson, a of Newton simulation is pretty well impossible. Although, I do want to mention that nowadays, obviously, with the growth of computer power, people are really beginning to look at this again and there has been an interesting, uh, there's some work by a Japanese group, I'm not sure if there's some more recent, and in particular by the group of uh, Stéphane Colombi in, in, in Paris. They've done some really interesting work on, the, on isolated systems for the moment, uh, in, in, but uh, also in principle could be uh, extended to the cosmological case, and I think that's the aim. So people are really uh, beginning to, some people are beginning to explore that. But what one does in practice is solve the n-body problem. So you just, uh, just as, you know, when we most, uh, as many sim people are familiar with here, when you, you simulate a long-range system, you don't do the blast of dynamics, you simulate an n-body system, and you're assuming that really your results, you're trying to probe a regime in which the results don't depend on the number of particles. So the particles in the n-body simulations of, simul of cosmologists, they're numerical particles, okay? They're discretizations of the mass density. They're not physical, astrophysical objects. In fact, their masses typically, because of limited resolution, are enormous, you know, they're of order, well, nowadays they can get down to, you know, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar masses or something like that on a, for a reasonably large simulation. But they're still, you know, they're not, they're big clumps even on an astrophysical scale. Whereas the real you know, matter particles, dark matter, is a microscopic particle with a mass of a GeV or something. Okay? So uh, they're softening. That's a whole issue I've got to just breathe and probably won't talk about. But you do soften uh, the potential at small scales. Essentially, I, the way I understand that, I think the best way of understanding that is that you do it for numerical reasons. That you can, it's just, uh, it, it greatly, it makes your numerical cost uh, grow enormously if you don't uh, soften the potential. But, or, well, you see, A of T is just a fixed function, OK? A of T is just a fixed background expansion. It's not coupled. That's a really good point. It's not only through the mean density, you see? It's just that's through the mean density. Once you have the mean density at some initial time, that's a fixed function. But in principle, you know, that's a back. You could have an, a question about how. Yeah. At a sufficiently large scale, it will always remain uniform. At a sufficiently large scale, you see. It's really at the large scale. That's the, you're taking out the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, okay. So the A of T is an input function from the cosmology. And uh, you've got, you just. The mass of the particles. M, the mass is the mass of the particles. 
Paper clay, yeah, yeah. How good is that resolution? Uh, no, that's the mass that? there. Okay, the mass there is the mass of the end body particle. It's not a physical mass. It's a mass. It's a, the yeah. I accept, well, in, in a, if you do a cosmological simulation, that has some, you know, it has some physical, you know, I don't know, it could be 10 to the 8 solar masses or something. I'm not saying it's that, but it's a, you know, it's a question of resolution. That's clearly, if you want to, you know, you, you're taking, does that, a, it's just, it's, it's, it's fixed by the numerical resolution. And they're not, as I said, not physical particles. And clearly you can't resolve structures that have less than 10 to the 8 particles. In fact, you have to ask the question, how many particles do I need to begin to be able to, I can, maybe can I resolve a galaxy, but you know, with that few, with that many, with that many particles, no, you can't really resolve a, a galaxy. But, yeah. This, these are purely self-gravitating particles. For the moment, you know, to make galaxies, I haven't made galaxies yet, and in fact, I'm not going to make galaxies. I'm going to say a little bit about it, but this is matter, just gravitating matter, okay? There's nothing else. And how I distribute or make the mass doesn't really matter. I mean, I, what the mass of the particles is, as we know, it's gravity, so it's just the accelerate, you know, it's not, it should, nothing should depend on the mass of the particles. Nothing that's physical here should depend on the mass of the particles. Anything that depends on the mass of the particle is a resolution effect, because it depends on the number of particles, right? Is that okay? Yeah. So, okay, I'll go on. Uh, okay, so initial conditions, you take this, you know, we want to uh, represent a continuous density field as well as possible with an N, with N points, and the way that people have come up with doing this is by taking a grid. So you take a grid, which is the uniform universe, and you displace particles off the grid. You have, there's a simple algorithm which allows you to, you know, for a given uh, density field, you have, you know how to do the displacements. You can kind of invert in order to get the density field you want, and uh, obviously over some range of scale. And uh, you put in the velocities just given by this linear mode. You have a velocity that is just a function of position once you have the, and is related to the local gravitational field. So that's, that's how you set up the initial conditions. So now we've got, you have to imagine this is an infinite universe, right? You're, you're actually going to make copies of that. What we do is simulate, you know, copies of that, an inf infinite number of copies. And the force is the force calculated in that infinite universe. The size of the box obviously should not matter. That's numerical as well. Everything we see should not depend on the size of the box. Okay, and of course one can check that, and and, and uh, it is true. So the size of simulations. This is from 2005 from a big uh, one of the big uh, groups of the Max Planck Institute, and uh, this was a map up to this is up to 2010. You know, people are doing 10 billion. Uh, particles now they're talking about aiming for I've heard recently people you know aiming for a trillion particle simulations uh, and uh, so this is uh, so I, I'm not you know I'm talking about show the, the actual simulations I'm showing here are small simulations but okay I showed you this picture yesterday that's an initial condition with a certain power spectrum a parallel power spectrum and what you see is the growth you know the development of these structures, smaller structures, and then larger structures. And for what concerns the dependence on the size of the box, basically, so long as those structures are relatively small compared to the size of the box, the size of the box doesn't matter. I mean, if the box was 10 times larger, this box would look the same. You know, they would, to, 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 it wouldn't, uh, the size, none of this is dependent on the size of the box. So this is a completely out of equilibrium problem. You have this, you know, continually development developing uh, structure, and uh, you know, it's got absolutely nothing to do with equilibrium. It's supposed to be representative of a of Lasse of Poisson dynamics where everything depends clearly strongly on initial conditions. That's in co-moving coordinates. So if you wanted to convert that into physical coordinates, you just have to multiply by the factor A of T. Uh, all that's included. The A, once you know the background, 
right? All the information about the background density goes into the scale, this A of T. And then that just tells you how to rescale that to physical coordinates. The pictures are in co-moving coordinates. On top of that, there's the, you know, if you didn't displace the lattice, everything would stay the same. In co-moving coordinates, the particles would follow the Hubble flow. They were, okay? So, uh, okay, so that's just a zoom in on a smaller region. You can see in a smaller region, uh, you have structures. So the structures of various different sizes form. Oh, sorry, that's a bit hard to, maybe impossible to see. Uh, that's just for a different power spectrum. What I wanted to illustrate is that this is a more closer to a cosmological power spectrum. You get more kind of large-scale structure. You can see this kind of filamentary structure in these, and that's due to the fact that there's more when you have a k to the minus two, that means it's, there's more long wavelength power, and that leads to a more kind of visible filament, filamentary structure in the thing. So this is an example just of already going back 10 years of, of a big paper where they did at what were at the time the very largest simulations. Uh, what you see at the bottom of this picture is the final configuration you know, at a one gigaparsec, so that's at a huge scale. It's basically still uniform, the density, with only initial fluctuations, and then they're, they're showing a zoom in. So you're seeing this hierarchical structure that has formed as a result of, you know, the smallest structures will in principle have four first, then bigger ones, then bigger ones, then bigger ones, and at this scale you're still, at the biggest scale you're still just have small density fluctuations. The colors here are, are density, okay? So yellow is very dense, red is less dense, and so on. And uh, so, um, Okay, you can see that same picture. Uh, basically, okay, maybe I just, what happens? I won't bother with that slide. Uh, it's just, well, that's just, would be from left to right, that's just a schematic picture in a simple simulation of the development of the correlation function, which is just basically also related you know, to the development of structure to larger and larger scales. It mon monotonically increases, and you can calculate the scale of nonlinearity. To go back to the validity of linear theory, so this is from that big paper, this is for a cold dark matter cosmology, you can see that the power, so this is the power spectrum, or it's k cubed times p of k, okay? So it's just a dimensionless, what they call, what's called the dimensionless power spectrum. As a, at small scales, you can see there are light lines that correspond to, the gray lines that correspond to linear amplification, okay? So where's my... Where did I put anybody see? Oh, there it is. So uh, here, so this would be the, this is early times, okay? This would be a more or less close to the, a little after the beginning of the simulation. The gray line would be linear theory, okay? And the linear, so if you were linearly amplified, you would follow the gray lines. But what you see is that you get deviation from the gray line, so nonlinearity, okay, developing at smaller and smaller k, that corresponds to larger and larger scales, okay? So you see that the modes, the linear theory remains valid at small scales, and the nonlinear nonlinearity develops. So just to summarize that, this, the basic thing is, again, linear theory describes the evolution well at sufficiently large scales. The nonlinearity scales grows monotonically, so maybe I'm bit, being a bit too repetitive. And in the nonlinear regime, the flow of power is from large to small scale. So you do see that there is this collapse going on in which you know, the fluctuations are going from large scales to, small, to smaller scales as predicted by you know, the spherical collapse model, that you end up with, start with something at this scale and you end up with a structure at this scale. You get a flow of power from large scale to small scale, okay? So... Uh, so the nonlinear regime. So how do we describe this nonlinear regime? I'm not going to try to be complete. I'm really just going to try to give you a picture of what the way most, I think, most people, cosmologists think about it. Uh, so one of the things that people noticed or checked early on in simulations was they went and took these clumps. So you can identify by eye that there are clumps. And you isolate clumps. You take out clumps using this criterion that their mean density uh, is about 200, from, which comes from the spherical collapse model. So you take out the biggest clumps in the, in the simulation, and you look at their distribution, and you find that they're reasonably well fit by this, uh, uh, very crudely fit by this press schecter, but then you can improve that model and 
uh, you can get reasonably good fits in a kind of phenomenal, slightly phenomenological manner. You, so this is, B, this is the number, this is the function n, m, or it's some related. This is basically, as a function of mass, the number of objects, the number of clumps. And you see at different times, you know, you get different, bigger clumps as time goes on, and you get a certain distribution. The little blue dotted lines are the very simple press schechter formalism that comes from uh, the spherical collapse model, and this is an improved kind of phenomenological model that's used, basically fitted from simulations, but can be justified uh, phenomenologically as well. Um, so, the dis how, do, how do people describe the, the nonlinear regime? So, the, the distribution masses, okay, I said that already. So, these clumps, okay, you've probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe if you've gone, seen any kind of talks in cosmology, you've heard people talk about dark matter halos, okay? So, what are these halos? They basically are uh, these clumps that you see in simulations, and I would say the way to put it is that the, physically, what are they supposed to be? They're supposed to be approximately virialized finite systems. The idea, again, based on the spherical collapse model, is that a region has undergone collapse and is virialized to some good approximation. And what people found in simulations is that it appears that the smaller scale structure is reasonably efficiently wiped out so that the biggest clumps are relatively smooth objects. But these are numerical results, okay? So the, these biggest clumps, the, 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 you have hierarchical formation of clumps, but there is some sort of merging pr process by which the big clumps turn into the biggest clumps that, that uh, collapse do actually kind of smooth out and form these kind of virialized objects. And what people do is then go and take these clumps out of simulation. So they have an algorithm, which I won't describe in detail, but it's a, little, a simple algorithm that will kind of select the clumps. You could even do it by eye. Initially, people did it by eye. Now they have algorithms to do it. Just take out the clumps, and they look at the density profile. They find the potential, the minimum of the potential, the gravitational potential, and they kind of study the density profiles and the properties of those clumps, right? And they find that they have apparently universal properties, that their profiles are uh, independent of cosmology and initial conditions. At least that's the claim. These are all numerical results, okay? So, uh, uh, let me see. Um, yeah, I'll just show you, you know, different simulations, they go select clumps out of them and they look at the density profiles and uh, study various different things about them. And so one of the, the, the this is the, the, the common, the most common uh, profile that's used uh, is the so-called NFW profile, Navarro, Frank, and White. I think this is one of the, one of the most cited papers in physics, apparently, in which they did that, uh, did, did this fit, numerical fit, uh, to uh, cosmological simulations. So what, what is that density profile? It says the density profile is about r to the minus one at small scales, and then r to the minus three at large scales. But since then, these have been refined. There's a lot of numerical issues. Other profiles have been fitted to it. But this never, nevertheless remains a kind of reference profile that people use. But it's purely numerical. There's no, for the moment, there's no convincing, in my view, no convincing explanation physically of where this, would, uh, where this really comes from. And uh, they are characterized by two parameters, these halos. They are parameterized by what the, the mass of the object and what's called its concentration. Its concentration is the ratio of its size, basically what was called its virial radius, to this radius at which it bends, okay? So you've got a density profile. So you've got a density profile, you know, in log log that looks something like this, r to the minus one, r to the minus three. There's a characteristic radius here called the scale radius. There's a cut here where you, 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 where you cut the, the object has a finite size, and the ratio of those is called its concentration. And then people go do numerical studies, enormous numerical resources, studying the, how the concentration and mass of these objects depend on the cosmology and what the relation is between the concentration and the mass. Okay, so... Uh, let me go on. So, okay, so halo models. So the analytical tool that people use to describe the nonlinear regime are these so-called halo models. 
So basically, the idea is that you describe the nonlinear density field as a kind of su superposition, as a sum of these halos. That it's basically, you know, you model it as a collection of these halos. It's an approximate description. And so I'll just give you, and then you can go and calculate things. So if you assume your ingredients uh, are, a prof you, you put in a profile, okay, and you put in, that's what I said, you put in the, these uh, things. So you, ask, you have to add the mass function for the halos, so you need to measure that, and you, you, you take some simple function from that. Uh, and then, in practice, people usually input what they call a mass concentration relationship, which is some empirical relation between the concentration and the mass of these objects, right? You take them out, they have a, a concentration and a mass, and to a first approximation, the concentration is a deterministic function of the mass, okay? And then you need to also have the correlation properties of these halos if you're going to write down, uh, uh, if you're going to write down a, write down. So you can then write down, okay, I just want to give an idea of what you do. So what they do is you take your profile, okay, it's the mass, and it's the, the, this is the normalized mass profile, the U, so it's just normalized to one. And you can write down the, uh, you know, you could calculate then a two-point correlation function, and you can calculate or two-point uh, two correlation of the density. And uh, there are different terms that appear in this. There's the, uh, uh, there's the, uh, there's a diagonal term which corresponds to taking, it's what called the one halo term, where the two points you select are in the same halo, and then there's the off diagonal term, the two halo term, where the points are not in the same halo. And, uh, okay, you can, you can write down this, so the two point correlations, for example, can be written as a function of then known objects, okay? They can be written as a function of the the, the ma this halo mass function and the profiles and the profiles of the of the halos, and this basically describes the high, strongly nonlinear regime. And then you have parts that the part the two halo term that describes the larger larger scales. Okay, so it's just basically this is a purely phenomenological model. Okay, but it doesn't come from it comes from simulations. And it comes from the observation that simulations can be approximately described as a kind of collection of clumps. And you can use that then to construct a model that has got some parameters in it, and you can measure those parameters from simulations. Why do you want to do that? Well, because you might, you then use those semi-analytical uh, models, these analytical expressions with a few unknown parameters to determine obs observational quantities. If you want to work out how the matter field is going to lens is going to have effect on lensing objects that are far away, then you have to have, a, uh, if you have an expression, an analytical expression for the density, the correlation properties, you can actually write down uh, something. So you can get, it allows you basically to summarize the, and, and describe phenomenologically the um, structure formation, the, the nonlinear structure formation. Okay, so galaxies, okay, I said I'm not really going to say, how do, uh, to, to, you can then use these models actually in a phenomenological way, again, to construct uh, galaxy, the ideas that these halos are then sites for galaxy formation. Hey, they're overdense, they're potential, there's a gravitational potential, they're where galaxies are going to form. And the way that's uh, constructed is that basically you have, you say that you assume that you have a certain probability of having a galaxy of a certain type inside a certain halo. And then you do some statistics, and you can work out the statistical properties of the galaxy. You put in lots of parameters, and you fit basically to the to the data. So there's, it's very phenomenological approach. It's that that's where that's basically uh, what is done at the moment for the non nonlinear regime. Okay, I'm not going to get to my 1D models, but I'm just going to say so. I'm going to finish uh, with uh, maybe just some comments on on open issues. Um, so how is the nonlinear clustering uh, best characterized? Uh, so here, maybe there's uh, the question is, you know, you can use endpoint correlation functions, or maybe, you, the, maybe there are other ways one can describe this correlated, these correlated structures that haven't been used. The dominant tool at the moment is this kind of phenomenological tool, but I don't think you know, that that's a closed issue as to what's the right way. Is this HALO model even uh, the right way, really, to describe is it sufficiently accurate? Is it really the right way to describe 
the matter density. And this issue of how the non cluster clustering, how does it depend on initial conditions in cosmology? And that's what one of the major questions that cosmologist is interested in. It's saying, but if I can measure through galaxy correlations, I can measure, infer the density fluctuations, the density fluctu the underlying matter density, can I infer information about cosmological in con initial conditions and, uh, and uh, the history of the expansion, the function AFT, basically. You see, you can put in different functions AFT, and that's going to change what happens, right? So, or is the inner structure of these halos something universal that's got nothing to do with, it's just something to do with gravity or something to do with maybe there's a whole literature on people trying to use statistical mechanics approaches to understanding the, the structure of these halos. Is it got to do with just statistical mechanics and gravity? Those are open questions, I would say. They're completely open. And I just want to maybe finish by just commenting on, uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll, okay, the halo model, halos are, have the problem that they're rather poorly defined objects. The approximation that they're smooth is actually problematic. Uh, re resolution, increasing of resolution in simulations has really revealed that there's more and more substructure, and it's not really clear if it's, it's, it's reasonable to assume that they're really smooth structures or if that's a just a problem in the simulations. And uh, so this universality, it's unclear what it means. I just want to talk, somebody asked the question yesterday about, uh, um, you know, uh, about, okay, you, you see, the, I showed you the simulation of a lattice and you set up this lattice, you could see the lattice structure. What, clearly that's not physical and nothing should depend on the number of particles. So um, the question in, in n-body simulations, the resolution issue is how accurately does this finite n-body representation uh, represent the underlying continuum of physical model? What are the finite n effects? So if you take um, you know, a, a finite system and a long-range system, even gravitation system, and you let it... Uh, evolve into a verialized equilibrium, there is going to be some finite n effects, and they're believed to be, you know, on time scales that grow with n or, or that they're on very long time scales. So for a finite system, the problem is really just up to what time can I trust my simulation? Up to what time will my simulation re represent well the, the phase space uh, density and the velocity equation? In n-body simulations, it's more com complicated. The, really, the question is, up to what, at a given time, up to, up, up to what scale, or above what scale, can I trust my results? That's, so it's, it's also a question of scale and time, right? Right at the beginning of the simulation, so you really would like to say, what's the resolution as a function of time? The resolu what do I mean by the resolution? The resolution would be the scale above which the simulation approximates well the continuum model, right? So if you go to sufficiently large scales, you have a sufficient number of particles in any scale, it's reasonable that you would expect to go to the continuum model. But the question, the practical question is, you know, what is the resolution scale? And it's very, um, uh, it's very unclear, really. It's not, you know, I don't think it's a resolved issue as to what the answer to that question is. That, so the in, you introduce, actually, two non-physical parameters. So there was that, clearly, the size of the, the, the mean interparticle distance. You also introduce a softening in the force. So that's, those are unphysical parameters. Not, you know, those are numerical scale. Those are length scales, which are numerical, that are induced in the simulation. So you really want to work out how does the resolution depend on those scales and on the model. So I'm not, uh, maybe I'll just, to finish, um, i just say, maybe I don't really have time, so I'll just say, uh, you know, it's really a very, the reason why it's, it's, it's uh, clear that there, the problem is very, uh, uh, that the, the answer is not so clear in numerical, in cosmological simulations, is that in practice, the resolution that one usually assumes, assumes that it takes the scale of resolution at the end of the simulation to be even considerably smaller than the initial interparticle distance. So you, you'd say, okay, just take enough particles, take your smoothing length sufficiently large and just take a huge number of particles, you should be okay. We're not in that regime at all. We're not even close to that regime. And for very, you know, because uh, the, there, there are argument, qualitative arguments that justify 
use, making much more optimistic assumptions. But the assumptions that are made are very optimistic, okay? And uh, I'll basically, okay, I'm not going to, I say that is a very open question. I think there's an interesting uh, literature. Maybe I'll just finish to show something that I, I've done or that actually that Bruno did. This is just to illustrate, uh, you know, the existence of these finite n effects. This is, these are four, uh, that, those are three different lattices. I think here is a simple cubic lattice. That's a body-centered cubic lattice, a face-centered cubic lattice. And here you can't see it's actually a disordered configuration. And on top of those, we've put exactly the same density fluctuation. So it's the same cosmological model with a slightly different discretization, but the same number of particles. Okay? So when we evolve it, this is a simple test, nothing should be, anything physical should be different. So uh, there you evolve to A is equal to 8. And you can see at your distance, actually, and with the light in the room, they probably look absolutely identical. You need to go closer to start seeing differences. But that's at very, very large scale. Remember, the lattice spacing is you could barely see it on the initial. You could just about see it. And then you go forward, and that's you know, further. You can see that you have. And that's, again, they look very good. At large scale, it produces. It's not sensitive to the small scale discretization. Whereas if you go in and zoom in, so now I'm zooming in on uh, like four or five lattice spacings, and you go in uh, and you see what that produces. Now you can see at that scale, you know, very visible. This is the same realization of the density field. There are diff they're this exactly the same initial cosmological simulation. There's not even a different realization, right? It's the same realization. You get wasp, it's pretty obvious it has to be the same realization. But you can see here quite visible differences, right? And the, the differences are at scales in the assumptions in cosmological simulations. The assumption often made is that the resolution really goes down well below this scale. So it's actually that basically all the clustering you can measure in that is uh, unaffected by... Uh, but so anyway, this is just to give you an idea. And in, in illustration, this is a tiny thing you can change, and you can see that there's differences. Obviously, this is a fixed number of particles, so this doesn't ask the question, how does it depend on the number of particles? But there's an open question about resolution. It may be, why is it so important? It may be that halos cannot be well described as smooth objects, and that there's some sort of hierarchical structure. Uh, it's, it's really not clear, at least I'm, the, this is more personal point of view. I, I think there's, there's a, a lot of, there's an open question about the, really the nature of the, the, the clustering in, in the nonlinear regime. And uh, I think one of the interesting things that's happening is that people, you know, maybe looking at the Vlasov Poisson route in time may help to resolve some of these questions. Okay, so I'll stop. I didn't do any 1D, but too bad. Yeah.